Chapter 11. On the Doorstep In two days going, they rode right up the long lake and passed out into the river running, and now they could all see the lonely mountain towering grim and tall before them. The stream was strong, and their going slow. At the end of the third day, some miles up the river, they drew into the left or western bank and disembarked. Here they were joined by the horses with other provisions and necessaries, and the ponies for their own use that had been sent to meet them. They packed what they could on the ponies, and the rest was made into a store under a tent, but none of the men of the town would stay with them even for the night so near the shadow of the mountain. "'Not at any rate, until the songs have come true,' said they. It was easier to believe in the dragon, and less easy to believe in Thorn in these wild parts. Indeed, their stores had no need of any guard, for all the land was desolate and empty. So their escort left them, making off swiftly down the river and the shoreward paths, although the night was already drawing on. They spent a cold and lonely night, and their spirits fell. The next day they set out again. Balin and Bilbo rode behind, each leading another pony, heavily laden, beside him. The others were some way ahead, picking out a slow road, for there were no paths. They made northwest, slanting away from the river running, and drawing ever nearer and nearer to a great spur of the mountain that was flung out southwards towards them. It was a weary journey, and a quiet and stealthy one. There was no laughter, or song, or sound of harps, and the pride and hopes which had stirred in their hearts at the singing of old songs by the lake died away to a plodding gloom. They knew that they were drawing near to the end of their journey, and that it might be a very horrible end. The land about them grew bleak and barren, though once, as Thorin told them, it had been green and fair. There was little grass, and before long there was neither bush nor tree, and only broken and blackened stumps to speak of ones long vanished. They were come to the desolation of the dragon, and they were come at the waning of the year. They reached the skirts of the mountain all the same, without meeting any danger or any sign of the dragon other than the wilderness he had made about his lair. The mountain lay dark and silent before them, and ever higher above them. They made their first camp on the western side of the great southern spur, which ended in a height called Raven Hill. On this there had been an old watch-post, but they dared not climb it yet. It was too exposed. Before setting out to search, the western spurs of the mountain for the hidden door, on which all their hopes rested, Thorin sent out a scouting expedition to spy out the land to the south, where the front gate stood. For this purpose he chose Balin and Feely and Keeley, and with them went Bilbo. They marched under the gray and silent cliffs to the feet of Raven Hill. There the river, after winding a wide loop over the valley of Dale, turned from the mountain on its road to the lake, flowing swift and noisily. Its bank was bare and rocky, tall and steep above the stream, and gazing out from it over the narrow water, foaming and splashing among many boulders, they could see in the wide valley, shadowed by the mountain's arms, the gray ruins of ancient houses, towers, and walls. "'There lies all that is left of Dale,' said Balin. "'The mountain sides were green with woods, and all the sheltered valley rich and pleasant in the days, where the bells rang in that town.' He looked both sad and grim as he said this. He had been one of Thorin's companions on the day the dragon came. They did not dare to follow the river much further towards the gate, but they went on beyond the end of the southern spur, until lying hidden behind a rock they could look out and see the dark cavernous opening in a great cliff wall between the arms of the mountain. Out of it the waters of the running river sprang and out of it too there came a steam and a dark smoke nothing moved in the waste save the vapor and the water and every now and again a black and ominous crow the only sound was the sound of the stony water and every now and again the harsh croak of a bird balin shuddered let us return he said 
We can do no good here, and I don't like these dark birds. They look like spies of evil. The dragon is still alive and in the halls under the mountain, then. Or I imagine so from the smoke, said the hobbit. That does not prove it, said Balin, though I don't doubt you are right. But he might be gone away some time, or he might be lying out on the mountainside, keeping watch. And still I expect smokes and steams would come out of the gates. All the halls within must be filled with his foul reek. With such gloomy thoughts, followed ever by croaking crows, above them they made their weary way back to the camp. Only in June they had been guests in the fair house of Elnron, and though autumn was now crawling towards winter, that pleasant time now seemed years ago. They were alone in the perilous waste without hope of further help. They were at the end of their journey, but as far as ever, it seemed, from the end of their quest, none of them had much spirit left. Now, strange to say, Mr. Baggins had more than the others. He would often borrow Thorin's map and gaze at it, pondering over the runes and the message of the moon letters Elrond had read. It was he that made the dwarves begin the dangerous search on the western slopes for the secret door. They moved their camp then to a long valley, narrower than the great dale, in the south where the gates of the river stood, and walled with lower spurs of the mountain. Two of these here thrust forward west from the main mass in long, steep, sided ridges that fell ever downwards towards the plain. On this western side there were fewer signs of the dragon's marauding feet, and there was some grass for their ponies. From this western camp, shadowed all day by cliff and wall until the sun began to sink towards the forest, day by day they toiled in parties, searching for paths up the mountainside. If the map was true, somewhere high above the cliff at the valley's head must stand the secret door. Day by day they came back to their camp without success. But at last, unexpectedly, they found what they were seeking. Feely and Keeley and the hobbit went back one day down the valley and scrambled among the tumbled rocks at its southern corner. About midday, creeping behind a great stone that stood alone like a pillar, Bilbo came on what looked like rough steps going upwards. Following these excitedly, he and the dwarves found traces of a narrow track, often lost, often rediscovered. That wandered on the top of the southern ridge and brought them at last to a still narrower ledge, which turned north across the face of the mountain. Looking down, they saw that they were at the top of the cliff at the valley's head and were gazing down on their own camp below. Silently, clinging to the rocky wall on their right, they went in single file along the ledge till the wall opened and they turned into a little steep-walled bay, grassy-floored, still and quiet. Its entrance, which they had found, could not be seen from below because of the overhang of the cliff, nor from further off because it was so small that it looked like a dark crack and no more. It was not a cave, and was open to the sky above, but at its inner end a flat wall rose up that, in the lower part, close to the ground, was as smooth and upright as mason's work, but without a joint or crevice to be seen. No sign was there of post or lintel or threshold, nor any sign of bar or bolt or keyhole. Yet they did not doubt that they had found the door at last. They beat on it, they thrust and pushed at it, they implored it to move, they spoke fragments of broken spells, of opening, and nothing stirred. At last, tired out, they rested on the grass at its feet, and then at evening began their long climb down. There was excitement in the camp that night. In the morning they prepared to move once more. Only Bofur and Bombor were left behind to guard the ponies and such stores as they had brought with them from the river. The others went down the valley and up the newly found path, and so to the narrow ledge. Along this they could carry no bundles or packs, so narrow and breathless was it. With a fall of a hundred and fifty feet beside them on to sharp rocks below, but each of them took a good coil of rope wound tight about his waist, and so at last, without mishap, they reached the little grassy bay. 
There they made their third camp, hauling up what they needed from below with their ropes. Down the same way, they were able occasionally to lower one of the more active dwarves, such as Keeley, to exchange such news as there was, or to take a share in the guard below, while Bofor was hauled up to the higher camp. Bomber would not come up either the rope or the path. I am too fat for such fly walks, he said. I should turn dizzy and tread on my beard, and then you would be thirteen again, and the knotted ropes are too slender for my weight. Luckily for him, that was not true, as you will see. In the meanwhile, some of them explored the ledge beyond the opening, and found a path that led higher and higher on to the mountain, but they did not dare to venture very far that way, nor was there much use in it. Out up there a silence reigned, broken by no bird or sound except that of the wind in the crannies of stone. They spoke low and never called or sang, for danger brooded in every rock. The others, who were busy with the secret of the door, had no more success. They were too eager to trouble about the ruins or the moon letters, but tried without resting to discover where exactly in the smooth face of the rock the door was hidden. They had brought picks and tools of many sorts from Lake Town, and at first they tried to use them. But when they struck the stone, the handle splintered and jarred their arms cruelly, and the steel heads broke or bent like lead. Mining work, they saw clearly, was no good against the magic that had shut this door, and they grew terrified, too, of the echoing noise. Bilbo found sitting on the doorstep lonesome and wearisome. There was not a doorstep, of course, really, but they used to call the little grassy space between the wall and the opening the doorstep in fun, remembering Bilbo's words long ago at the unexpected party in his hobbit hole, when he said they could sit on the doorstep till they thought of something, and sit and think they did, or wandered aimlessly about, and glummer and glummer they became. Their spirits had risen a little at the discovery of the path, but now they sank into their boots, and yet they would not give it up and go away. The hobbit was no longer much brighter than the dwarves. He could do nothing but sit with his back to the rock face and stare away west through the opening, or over the cliff, over the wide lands to the black wall of Mirkwood, and to the distance beyond in which he sometimes thought he could catch glimpses of the misty mountains, small and far. If the dwarves asked him what he was doing, he answered, You said sitting on the doorstep and thinking would be my job, not to mention getting inside, so I am sitting and thinking. But I am afraid he was not thinking much of the job, but of what lay beyond the blue distance, the quiet western land, and the hill, and his hobbit hole under it. A large gray stone lay in the center of the grass, and he stared moodily at it, or watched the great snails. They seemed to love the little shut-in bay with its walls of cool rock, and there were many of them of huge size crawling slowly and stickily along its sides. "'Tomorrow begins the last week of autumn,' said Thorin, one day. "'And winter comes after autumn,' said Bilfer. "'And next year, after that,' said Dwalin, "'and our beards will grow till they hang down the cliff to the valley before anything happens here.' What is our burglar doing for us, since he has got an invisible ring and ought to be a specially excellent performer now? I am beginning to think he might go through the front gate and spy things out a bit. Bilbo heard this. The dwarves were on the rocks just above the enclosure where he was sitting. And, good gracious, he thought, so that is what they are beginning to think, is it? It is always poor me that has to get them out of their difficulties. At least since the wizard left, whatever am I going to do? I might have known that something dreadful would happen to me in the end. I don't think I could bear to see the unhappy valley of Dale again, and as for the steaming gate... That night he was very miserable, and hardly slept. Next day the dwarves all went wandering off in various directions. Some were exercising the ponies down below. Some were roving about the mountainside. All day Bilbo sat gloomily in the grassy bay, gazing at the stone or out west through the narrow opening. He had a queer feeling that he was waiting for something. Perhaps the wizard will suddenly come back today, he thought. 
If he lifted his head, he could see a glimpse of the distant forest. As the sun turned west, there was a gleam of yellow upon its far roof, as if the light caught the last pale leaves. Soon he saw the orange ball of the sun sinking towards the level of his eyes. He went to the opening, and there, pale and faint, was a thin new moon above the rim of earth. At that very moment he heard a sharp crack behind him. There, on the gray stone in the grass, was an enormous thrush, nearly coal black, its pale yellow breast freckled with dark spots. Crack! It had caught a snail and was knocking it on the stone. Crack! Crack! Suddenly Bilbo understood. Forgetting all danger, he stood on the ledge and hailed the dwarves, shouting and waving. Those that were nearest came tumbling over the rocks and as fast as they could along the ledge to him, wondering what on earth was the matter. The others shouted to be hauled up the ropes, except Bombor, of course. He was asleep. Quickly Bilbo explained. They all fell silent. The hobbit, standing by the gray stone, and the dwarves with wagging beards watching impatiently. The sun sank lower and lower, and their hopes fell. It sank into a belt of reddened cloud and disappeared. The dwarves groaned, but still Bilbo stood, almost without moving. The little moon was dipping to the horizon. Evening was coming on. Then suddenly, when their hope was lowest, a red ray of the sun escaped like a finger through a rent in the cloud. A gleam of light came straight through the opening into the bay and fell on the smooth rockfuss. The old thrush, who had been watching from a high perch with beady eyes and head cocked on one side, gave a sudden trill. There was a loud crack. A flake of rock split from the wall and fell. A hole appeared suddenly about three feet from the ground. Quickly, trembling lest the chance should fade, the dwarves rushed to the rock and pushed in vain. The key! The key! cried Bilbo. Where is Thorin? Thorin hurried up. The key! shouted Bilbo. The key that went with the map! Try it now while there is still time! Then Thorin stepped up and drew the key on its chain from round his neck. He put it to the hole. It fitted and it turned. Snap! The gleam went out. The sun sank. The moon was gone and evening sprang into the sky. Now they all pushed together and slowly a part of the rock wall gave way. Long straight cracks appeared and widened. A door five feet high and three broad was outlined and slowly, without a sound, swung inwards. It seemed as if darkness flowed out like a vapor from the hole in the mountainside, and deep darkness, in which nothing could be seen, lay before their eyes, a yawning mouth leading in and down. Chapter 12 Inside Information For a long time the dwarves stood in the dark before the door and debated, until at last Thorin spoke. Now is the time for our esteemed Mr. Baggins, who has proved himself a good companion on our long road, and a hobbit full of courage and resource far exceeding his size, and if I may say so, possessed of good luck far exceeding the usual allowance. Now is the time for him to perform the service for which he was included in our company. Now is the time for him to earn his reward." You are familiar with Thorin's style on important occasions, so I will not give you any more of it, though he went on a good deal longer than this. It certainly was an important occasion, but Bilbo felt impatient. By now he was quite familiar with Thorin too, and he knew what he was driving at. If you mean to think it is my job to go into the secret passage first, O Thorin Thrain's son Oakenshield, May your beard grow ever longer, he said crossly. Say so at once, and have done. I might refuse. I have got you out of two messes already, which were hardly in the original bargain, so that I am, I think, already owed some reward. But third time pays for all, as my father used to say, and somehow I don't think I shall refuse. Perhaps I have begun to trust my luck more than I used to in the old days. He meant last spring, before he left his own house, but it seems centuries ago. But anyway, I think I will go and have a peep at once and get it over. 
Now who is coming with me? He did not expect a chorus of volunteers, so he was not disappointed. Feely and Keely looked uncomfortable and stood on one leg, but the others made no pretense of offering, except old Balin, the lookout man, who was rather fond of the hobbit. He said he would come inside at least and perhaps a bit of the way too, ready to call for help if necessary. The most that can be said for the dwarves is this. They intended to pay Bilbo really handsomely for his services. They had brought him to do a nasty job for them, and they did not mind the poor little fellow doing it if he would, but they would all have done their best to get him out of trouble, if he got into it, as they did in the case of the trolls at the beginning of their adventures, before they had any particular reason for being grateful to him. There it is. Dwarves are not heroes, but calculating folk with a great idea of the value of money. Some are tricky and treacherous, and pretty bad lots. Some are not, but are decent enough people like Thorn and company, if you don't expect too much. The stars were coming out behind him in a pale sky, barred with black, when the hobbit crept through the enchanted door and stole into the mountain. It was far easier going than he expected. This was no goblin entrance or rough wood elves cave. It was a passage made by dwarves at the height of their wealth and skill, straight as a ruler, smooth floored and smooth sided, going with a gentle, never varying slope direct to some distant end in the blackness below. After a while, Balin bade Bilbo, Good luck! and stopped where he could still see the faint outline of the door and by a trick of the echoes of the tunnel hear the rustle of the whispering voices of the others just outside. Then the hobbit slipped on his ring, and warned by the echoes to take more than hobbit's care to make no sound. He crept noiselessly down, down, down into the dark. He was trembling with fear, but his little face was set and grim. Already he was a different hobbit from the one that had run out with a pocket handkerchief from Bag End long ago. He had not had a pocket handkerchief for ages. He loosened his dagger in its sheath, tightened his belt, and went on. Now you are in for it at last, Bilbo Baggins, he said to himself. You went and put your foot right in that night of the party, and now you have to go pull it out and pay for it. Dear me, what a fool I was and am, said the laced Tookish part of him. I have absolutely no use for dragon-guarded treasures, and the whole lot could stay here forever. If only I could wake up and find this beastly tunnel was my own front hall at home. He did not wake up, of course, but went still on and on, till all sign of the door behind him had faded away. He was altogether alone. Soon, he thought, it was beginning to feel warm. Is that a kind of a glow I seem to see? coming right ahead down there, he thought. It was. As he went forward, it grew and grew, till there was no doubt about it. It was a red light, steadily getting redder and redder. Also, it was now undoubtedly hot in the tunnel. Wisps of vapor floated up and passed him, and he began to sweat. A sound, too, began to throb in his ears, a sort of bubbling like the noise of a large pot galloping on the fire mixed with a rumble as of a gigantic tomcat purring. This grew to the unmistakable gurgling noise of some vast animal snoring in its sleep down there in the red glow in front of him. It was at this point that Bilbo stopped. Going on from there was the bravest thing he ever did. The tremendous things that happened afterwards were as nothing compared to it. He fought the real battle in the tunnel alone before he ever saw the vast danger that lay in wait. At any rate, after a short halt, go on he did, and you can picture him coming to the end of the tunnel, an opening of much the same size and shape as the door above. Through its peeps the hobbit's little head. Before him lies the great bottomless cellar, or dungeon hall of the ancient dwarves, right at the mountain's root. It is almost dark, so that its vastness can only be dimly guessed. But rising from the near side of the rocky floor, there is a great glow, the glow of smog. There he lay, 
a vast red golden dragon fast asleep. A thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils, and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, and about him, on all sides, stretching away across the unseen floors, lay countless piles of precious things, gold wrought and unwrought, gems and jewels, and silver red stained in the ruddy light. Smog lay, with wings folded like an immeasurable bat, turned partly on one side, so that the hobbit could see his underparts, and his long, pale belly, crusted with gems and fragments of gold, from his long lying on his costly bed. Behind him, where the walls were nearest, could dimly be seen coats of mail, helms and axes, swords and spears hanging, and there, in rows, stood great jars and vessels, filled with a wealth that could not be guessed. To say that Bilbo's breath was taken away is no description at all. There are no words left to express his staggerment, since men changed the language that they learned of elves in the days when all the world was wonderful. Bilbo had heard tell and sing of dragon hordes before, but the splendor, the lust, the glory of such treasure had never yet come home to him. His heart was filled and pierced with enchantment, and with the desire of the dwarves, and he gazed motionless, almost forgetting the frightful guardian, at the gold beyond price and count. He gazed for what seemed an age, before drawn almost against his will. He stole from the shadow of the doorway, across the floor to the nearest edge of the mounds of treasure. Above him the sleeping dragon lay, a dire menace even in his sleep. He grasped a great two-handled cup, as heavy as he could carry, and cast one fearful eye upwards. Smog stirred a wing, opened a claw, the rumble of his snoring changed its note. Then Bilbo fled, but the dragon did not wake, not yet, but shifted into other dreams of greed and violence, lying there in a stolen hall, while the little hobbit toiled back up the long tunnel. His heart was beating, and a more fevered shaking was in his legs than when he was going down, but still he clutched the cup, and his chief thought was, I've done it. This will show them. More like a grocer than a burglar. Indeed, we'll hear no more of that. Nor did he. Balin was overjoyed to see the hobbit again, and as delighted as he was surprised. He picked Bilbo up and carried him out into the open air. It was midnight and clouds had covered the stars, but Bilbo lay with his eyes shut, gasping and taking pleasure in the feel of the fresh air again, and hardly noticing the excitement of the dwarves, or how they praised him and patted him on the back, and put themselves and all their families for generations to come at his service. The dwarves were still passing the cup from hand to hand, and talking delightedly of the recovery of their treasure, when suddenly a vast rumbling woke in the mountain, underneath as if it was an old volcano that had made up its mind to start eruptions once again. The door behind them was pulled nearly to, and blocked from closing with a stone, but up the long tunnel came the dreadful echoes, from down in the depths, of a bellowing and trampling, that made the ground beneath them tremble. Then the dwarves forgot their joy and their confident boasts of a moment before, and cowered down in fright. Smog was still to be reckoned with. It does not do to leave a live dragon out of your calculations if you live near him. Dragons may not have much real use for all their wealth, but they know it to an ounce as a rule, especially after long possession and Smog was no exception. He had passed from an uneasy dream in which a warrior, altogether insignificant in size, but provided with a bitter sword and great courage, figured most unpleasantly to a doze, and from a doze to a wide awakening. There was a breath of strange air in his cave. Could there be a drought from the little hole? He had never felt quite happy about it, though it was so small, and now he glared at it in suspicion, and wondered why he had never blocked it up. Of late he had half fancied he had caught the dim echoes of a knocking sound from far above, 
that came down through it to his lair. He stirred and stretched forth his neck to sniff. Then he missed the cup. Thieves! Fire! Murder! Such a thing had not happened since first he came to the mountain. His rage passes description. The sort of rage that is only seen when rich folk that have more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but never before used or wanted. His fire belched forth. The hall smoked. He shook the mountain roots. He thrust his head in vain at the little hole, and then coiling his length together, roaring like thunder underground, he sped from his deep lair through its great door, out into the huge passages of the mountain palace, and up towards the front gate. To hunt the whole mountain till he had caught the thief, and had torn and trampled him, was his one thought. He issued from the gate, the waters rose and fierce whistling steam, and up he soared, blazing into the air, and settled on the mountain top in a spout of green and scarlet flame. The dwarves heard the awful rumor of his flight, and they crouched against the walls of the grassy terrace, cringing under boulders, hoping somehow to escape the frightful eyes of the hunting dragon. There they would have all been killed if it had not been for Bilbo once again. Quick, quick! he gasped. The door! The tunnel! It's no good here! Roused by these words, they were just about to creep inside the tunnel when Biffer gave a cry. My cousins! Bumbor and Bofur! We have forgotten them! They are down in the valley! They will be slain, and all our ponies too, and all our stores lost! moaned the others. We can do nothing! Nonsense! said Thorin, recovering his dignity. We cannot leave them! Get inside, Mr. Baggins and Balin! You two, Feely and Keely, the dragon shan't have all of us. Now, you others, where are the ropes? Be quick. Those were perhaps the worst moments they had been through yet. The horrible sounds of Smog's anger were echoing in the stony hollows far above. At any moment, he might come blazing down or fly, whirling round, and find them near the perilous cliffs, edge hauling madly on the ropes. Up came Bofur, and still all was safe. Up came Bomber, puffing and blowing while the ropes creaked, and still all was safe. Up came some tools and bundles of stores, and then danger was upon them. A whirring noise was heard. A red light touched the points of standing rocks. The dragon came. They had barely time to fly back to the tunnel, pulling and dragging in their bundles, when smog came hurtling from the north, licking the mountain sides with flames, beating his great wings with a noise like a roaring wind. His hot breath shriveled the grass before the door and drove in through the crack they had left and scorched them as they lay hid. Flickering fires leaped up and black rock shadows danced. Then darkness fell as he passed again. The ponies screamed with terror, burst their ropes, and galloped wildly off. The dragon swooped and turned to pursue them, and was gone. "'That'll be the end of our poor beasts,' said Thorin. "'Nothing can escape Smog once he sees it. Here we are, and here we shall have to stay, unless any one fancies tramping the long open miles back to the river with Smog on the watch.' It was not a pleasant thought. They crept further down the tunnel, and there they lay and shivered, though it was warm and stuffy until dawn came pale through the crack of the door. Every now and again through the night they could hear the roar of the flying dragon grow and then pass and fade, as he hunted round and round the mountainsides. He guessed from the ponies and from the traces of the camps he had discovered that men had come up from the river and the lake and had scaled the mountainside from the valley where the ponies had been standing, but the door withstood his searching eye and the little high-walled bay had kept out his fiercest flames. Long he had hunted in vain, till the dawn chilled his wrath, and he went back to his golden couch to sleep, and to gather new strength. He would not forget or forgive the theft, not if a thousand years turned him to a smoldering stone, but he could afford to wait. Slow and silent, he crept back to his lair, and half closed his eyes. When morning came, the terror of the dwarves grew less. 
they realized that dangers of this kind were inevitable in dealing with such a guardian, and that it was no good giving up their quest yet, nor could they get away just now, as Thorn had pointed out. Their ponies were lost or killed, and they would have to wait some time before Smog relaxed his watch sufficiently for them to dare the long way on foot. Luckily, they had saved enough of their stores to last them still for some time. They debated long on what was to be done, but they could think of no way of getting rid of Smog, which had always been a weak point in their plans, as Bilbo felt inclined to point out. Then, as is the nature of folk that are thoroughly perplexed, they began to grumble at the hobbit, blaming him for what at first so pleased them, for bringing away a cup and stirring up Smog's wrath so soon. "'What else do you suppose a burglar is to do?' asked Bilbo angrily. "'I was not engaged to kill dragons. That is warrior's work. But to steal treasure, I made the best beginning I could. Did you expect me to trot back with the whole horde of Thror on my back? If there is any grumbling to be done, I think I might have a say. You ought to have brought five hundred burglars, not one. I am sure it reflects great credit on your grandfather, but you cannot pretend that you ever made the vast extent of his wealth clear to me.' I should want hundreds of years to bring it all up, if I was fifty times as big and smog as tame as a rabbit. After that, of course, the dwarves begged his pardon. What then do you propose we should do, Mr. Baggins? asked Thorin politely. I have no idea at the moment. If you mean about removing the treasure, that obviously depends entirely on some new turn of luck and the getting rid of smog. Getting rid of dragons is not at all in my line, but I will do my best to think about it. Personally, I have no hopes at all, and wish I was safe back at home. Never mind that for the moment. What are we to do now, today? Well, if you really want my advice, I should say we can do nothing but stay where we are. By day we can no doubt creep out safely enough to take the air. Perhaps before long, one or two could be chosen to go back to the store by the river and replenish our supplies. But in the meanwhile, everyone ought to be well inside the tunnel by night. Now I will make you an offer. I have got my ring and will creep down this very noon. Then, if ever smog out to be napping, and see what he is up to, perhaps something will turn up. Every worm has his weak spot as my father used to say, though I am sure it was not from personal experience. Naturally, the dwarves accepted the offer eagerly. Already they had come to respect little Bilbo. Now he had become the real leader in their adventure. He had begun to have ideas and plans of his own. When midday came, he got ready for another journey down into the mountain. He did not like it, of course, but it was not so bad now he knew, more or less, what was in front of him. Had he known more about dragons and their wily ways, he might have been more frightened and less hopeful of catching this one napping. The sun was shining when he started, but it was as dark as night in the tunnel. The light from the door, almost closed, soon faded as he went down. So silent was his going that smoke on a gentle wind could hardly have surpassed it and he was inclined to feel a bit proud of himself as he drew near the lower door. There was only the very faintest glow to be seen. Old Smog is weary and asleep, he thought. He can't see me, and he won't hear me. Cheer up, Bilbo. He had forgotten, or had never heard, about Dragon's sense of smell. It is also an awkward fact that they can keep half an eye open, watching while they sleep, if they are suspicious. Smog certainly looked fast asleep, almost dead and dark, with scarcely a snore more than a whiff of unseen steam, when Bilbo peeped once more from the entrance. He was just about to step out onto the floor when he caught a sudden thin and piercing ray of red from under the drooping lid of Smog's left eye. He was only pretending to sleep. He was watching the tunnel entrance. Hurriedly, Bilbo stepped back and blessed the luck of his ring. Then Smog spoke. Well, thief, I smell you, and I feel your air. I hear your breath. Come along, help yourself again. There's plenty, and to spare. 
but Bilbo was not quite so unlearned in dragon lore as all that, and if Smog hoped to get him to come near so easily, he was disappointed. "'No, thank you, O Smog the Tremendous,' he replied. "'I did not come for presents. "'I only wished to have a look at you "'and see if you were truly as great as tales say.' "'I did not believe them.' "'Do you now?' said the dragon, somewhat flattered, "'even though he did not believe a word of it. "'Truly, songs and tales fall utterly short of the reality. "'O Smog the chiefest and greatest of calamities!' replied Bilbo. "'You have nice manners for a thief and a liar,' said the dragon. "'You seem familiar with my name, but I don't seem to remember smelling you before. Who are you, and where do you come from, may I ask?' "'You may indeed. I come from under the hill, and under the hills and over the hills my paths led, and through the air. I am he that walks unseen.' "'So I can well believe.' said Smog, but that is hardly your usual name. I am the clue finder, the web cutter, the stinging fly. I was chosen for the lucky number. Lovely titles, sneered the dragon, but lucky numbers don't always come off. I am he that buries his friends alive and drowns them and draws them alive again from the water. I came from the end of a bag, but no bag went over me. These don't sound so creditable, scoffed Smog. I am the friend of bears and the guest of eagles. I am ring winner and luck wearer, and I am barrel rider, went on Bilbo, beginning to be pleased with his riddling. That's better, said Smog, but don't let your imagination run away with you. This, of course, is the way to talk to dragons if you don't want to reveal your proper name which is wise, and don't want to infuriate them by a flat refusal, which is also very wise. No dragon can resist the fascination of riddling talk and of wasting time trying to understand it. There was a lot here which Smog did not understand at all, though I expect you do, since you know all about Bilbo's adventures to which he was referring. But he thought he understood enough, and he chuckled in his wicked inside. I thought so last night, he smiled to himself. Lakemen, some nasty scheme of those miserable tub-trading lakemen. Or I'm a lizard. I haven't been down that way for an age, and an age. But I will soon alter that. Very well, O oh barrel rider, he said aloud. Maybe barrel was your pony's name, and maybe not, though it was fat enough. You may walk unseen, but you did not walk all the way. Let me tell you, I ate six ponies last night, and I shall catch and eat all the others before long. In return for the excellent meal, I will give you one piece of advice for your good. Don't have more to do with dwarves than you can help. Dwarves? said Bilbo, in pretended surprise. Don't talk to me, said Smog. I know the smell and taste of dwarf, no one better. Don't tell me that I can eat a dwarf-ridden pony and not know it. You'll come to a bad end if you go with such friends, thief barrel rider. I don't mind if you go back and tell them so from me. But he did not tell Bilbo that there was one smell he could not make out at all. Hobbit smell. It was quite outside his experience and puzzled him mightily. I suppose you got a fair price for that cup last night, he went on. Come now, did you? Nothing at all? Well, that just like them. And I suppose they are skulking outside, and your job is to do all the dangerous work, and get what you can when I'm not looking for them? And you will get a fair share? Don't you believe it? If you get off alive, you will be lucky. Bilbo was now beginning to feel really uncomfortable. Whenever Smog's roving eye, seeking for him in the shadows, flashed across him, he trembled and an unaccountable desire seized hold of him to rush out and reveal himself and tell the truth to Smog. In fact, he was in grievous danger of coming under the dragon's spell, but plucking up courage, he spoke again. "'You don't know everything, O Smog the Mighty,' said he. "'Not gold alone brought us hither.' "'Ha, <laughs> ha, you admit the us,' 
laughed Smog. Why not say us fourteen and be done with it, Mr. Lucky Number? I am pleased to hear that you had an other business in these parts besides my gold. In that case, you may, perhaps, not altogether waste your time. I don't know if it has occurred to you that even if you could steal the gold bit by bit, a matter of a hundred years or so, you could not get it very far. Not much use on the mountainside, not much use in the forest, bless me. Had you never thought of the catch? A fourteenth share, I suppose, or something like it? Those were the terms, huh? But what about delivery? What about cartage? What about armed guards and tolls? And Smog laughed aloud. He had a wicked and wily heart, and he knew his guesses were not far out, though he suspected that the lake men were at the back of the plans, and that most of the plunder was meant to stop there in the town by the shore that in his young days had been called Esgoroth. You will hardly believe it, but poor Bilbo was really very taken aback. So far, all his thoughts and energies had been concentrated on getting to the mountain and finding the entrances. He had never bothered to wonder how the treasure was to be removed, certainly never how any part of it that might fall to his share was to be brought back all the way to Bag End, under Hill. Now, a nasty suspicion began to grow in his mind. Had the dwarves forgotten this important point, too? or were they laughing in their sleeves at him all the time? That is the effect that dragon talk has on the inexperienced. Bilbo, of course, ought to have been on his guard, but Smog had rather an overwhelming personality. I tell you, he said in an effort to remain loyal to his friends and to keep his end up, the gold was only an afterthought with us. We came over hill and under hill by wave and wind, for revenge. Surely, O oh Smog, the unaccessibly wealthy, you must realize that your success has made you some bitter enemies. Then Smog really did laugh, a devastating sound which shook Bilbo to the floor, while far up in the tunnel the dwarves huddled together and imagined that the hobbit had come to a sudden and nasty end. Revenge! He snorted, and the light of his eyes lit the hall from floor to ceiling like scarlet lightning. Revenge! The king under the mountain is dead, and where are his kin that dare seek revenge? Gurion, lord of Dale, is dead, and I have eaten his people like a wolf among sheep. And where are his sons, sons that dare approach me? I kill where I wish, and none dare resist. I laid low the warriors of old, and like is not in the world today. Then I was but young and tender. Now I am old and strong, strong, strong. Thief in the shadows, he gloated. My armor is like tenfold shields. My teeth are swords. My claws spears. The shock of my tail is thunderbolt. My wings a hurricane, and my breath death. I have always understood said Bilbo in a frightened squeak, that dragons were softer underneath, especially in the region of the er, chest. But doubtless one so fortified has thought of that. The dragon stopped short in his boasting. Your information is antiquated, he snapped. I am armored above and below with iron scales and hard gems. No blade can pierce me. I might have guessed it, said Bilbo. Truly, there can nowhere be found the equal of Lord Smog, the impenetrable. What magnificence! To possess a waistcoat of fine diamonds! Yes, it is rare and wonderful indeed, said Smug, absurdly pleased. He did not know that the hobbit had already caught a glimpse of his peculiar undercovering on his previous visit, and was itching for a closer view for reasons of his own. The dragon rolled over. Look! he said. What do you say to that? Dazzlingly marvelous! Perfect! Flawless! Staggering! exclaimed Bilbo aloud, but what he thought inside was, Old fool! Why, there is a large patch in the hollow of his left breast as bare as a snail out of its shell. After he had seen that Mr. Baggins' one idea was to get away, Well, I really must not detain your magnificence any longer, he said, or keep you from much-needed rest. Ponies take some catching, I believe, after a long start, 
and so do burglars, he added as a parting shot as he darted back and fled up the tunnel. It was an unfortunate remark, for the dragon spouted terrific flames after him, and fast though he sped up the slope, he had not gone nearly far enough to be comfortable before the ghastly head of smog was thrust against the opening behind him. Luckily, the whole head and jaws could not squeeze in, but the nostrils sent forth fire and vapor to pursue him, and he was nearly overcome, and stumbled blindly on in great pain and fear. He had been feeling rather pleased with the cleverness of his conversation with Smog, but his mistake at the end shook him into better sense. Never laugh at live dragons, Bilbo, you fool, he said to himself, and it became a favorite saying of his later, and passed into a proverb. You aren't nearly through this adventure yet, he added, and that was pretty true as well. The afternoon was turning into evening when he came out again and stumbled and fell in a faint on the doorstep. The dwarves revived him, and doctored his scorches as well as they could, but it was a long time before the hair on the back of his head and his heels grew properly again. It had all been singed and frizzled, right down to the skin. In the meanwhile, his friends did their best to cheer him up, and they were eager for his story especially wanting to know why the dragon had made such an awful noise, and how Bilbo had escaped. But the hobbit was worried and uncomfortable, and they had difficulty in getting anything out of him. On thinking things over, he was now regretting some of the things he had said to the dragon, and was not eager to repeat them. The old thrush was sitting on a rock nearby with his head cocked on one side, listening to all that was said. It shows what an ill temper Bilbo was in. He picked up a stone and threw it at the thrush, which merely fluttered aside and came back. Drat that bird, said Bilbo crossly. I believe he is listening, and I don't like the look of him. Leave him alone, said Thorin. The thrushes are good and friendly. This is a very old bird indeed, and is maybe the last left of the ancient breed that used to live about here, tame to the hands of my father and grandfather. They were a long-lived and magical race, and this might even be one of those that were alive then, a couple of hundreds of years or more ago. The men of Dale used to have the trick of understanding their language and use them for messengers to fly to the men of the lake and elsewhere. Well, he'll have news to take to Lake Town all right, if that is what he's after, said Bilbo, though I don't suppose there are any people left there that trouble with thrush language. "'Why, what has happened?' cried the dwarves. "'Do get on with your tale!' So Bilbo told them all he could remember, and he confessed that he had a nasty feeling that the dragon guessed too much from his riddles added to the camps and the ponies. "'I am sure he knows we came from Lake Town and had help from there, and I have a horrible feeling that his next move may be in that direction. I wish to goodness I had never said that about Barrel Rider.' It would make even a blind rabbit in these parts think of the lakeman. Well, well, it can't be helped, and it is difficult not to slip in talking to a dragon, or so I have always heard, said Balin, anxious to comfort him. I think you did very well, if you ask me. You found out one very useful thing at any rate, and got home alive, and that is more than most can say who have had words with the likes of smog. It may be a mercy and a blessing yet to know of the bare patch in the old worm's diamond waistcoat. That turned the conversation, and they all began discussing dragon slayings, historical, dubious, and mythical, and the various sorts of stabs and jabs and undercuts, and the different arts, devices, and stratagems by which they had been accomplished. The general opinion was that catching a dragon napping was not as easy as it sounded, and the attempt to stick one or prod one asleep was more likely to end in disaster than a bold frontal attack. All the while they talked the thrush, listened, till at last when the stars began to peep forth, it silently spread its wings and flew away. And all the while they talked and the shadows lengthened, Bilbo became more and more unhappy, and his foreboding grew. At last he interrupted them. I am sure we are very unsafe here he said, and I don't see the point of sitting here. The dragon has withered all the pleasant green, and anyway, the night has come and it is cold. But I feel it in my bones that this place will be attacked again. 
Smog knows now how I came down to his hall, and you can trust him to guess where the other end of the tunnel is. He will break all this side of the mountain to bits, if necessary, just to stop up our entrance, and if we are smashed with it, the better he will like it. You are very gloomy, Mr. Baggins, said Thorin. Why has not Smog blocked the lower end, then, if he is so eager to keep us out? He has not, or we should have heard him. I don't know, I don't know, because at first he wanted to try and lure me in again. I suppose, and now perhaps because he is waiting till after the tonight's hunt, or because he does not want to damage his bedroom if he can help it. But I wish you would not argue. Smog will be coming out at any minute now, and our only hope is to get well in the tunnel and shut the door. He seemed so much in earnest that the dwarves at last did as he said, though they delayed shutting the door. It seemed a desperate plan for no one knew whether or how they could get it open again from the inside, and the thought of being shut in a place from which the only way out led through the dragon's lair was not one they liked. Also, everything seemed quite quiet, both outside and down the tunnel. So for a longish while they sat inside, not far down from the half-open door, and went on talking. The talk turned to the dragon's wicked words about the dwarves. Bilbo wished he had never heard them, or at least that he could feel quite certain that the dwarves now were absolutely honest when they declared that they had never thought at all about what would happen after the treasure had been won. "'We knew it would be a desperate venture,' said Thorin, "'and we know that still. I still think that when we have won it will be time enough to think what to do about it, as for your share, Mr. Baggins, I assure you we are more than grateful, and you shall choose your own fourteenth, as soon as we have anything to divide. I am sorry if you are worried about transport, and I admit the difficulties are great. The lands have not welcomed less wild with the passing of time, rather the reverse. But we will do whatever we can for you, and take our share of the cost when the time comes. Believe me or not, as you like." From the talk turned to the great horde itself and to the things that Thorn and Balin remembered. They wondered if they were still lying there unharmed in the hall below. The spears that were made for the armies of the great King Blandorthan, long since dead, each had a thrice forged head, and their shafts were inlaid with cunning gold, but they were never delivered or paid for. Shields made for warriors, long dead, the great golden cup of Thror, two-handed, hammered, and carven with birds and flowers, whose eyes and petals were of jewels, coats of mail, gilded and silvered and impenetrable, the necklace of Gurion, lord of Dale, made of five hundred emeralds, green as grass, which he gave for the arming of his eldest son in a coat of dwarf-linked rings, the like of which had never been made before for it was wrought of pure silver to the power and strength of triple steel. But fairest of all was the great white gem, which the dwarves had found beneath the roots of the mountain, the heart of the mountain, the Arcan Stone of Thrain. The Arcan Stone! The Arcan Stone! murmured Thorin in the dark, half dreaming with his chin up his knees. It was like a globe with a thousand facets. It shone like silver in the firelight, like water in the sun, like snow under the stars, like rain upon the moon. But the enchanted desire of the horde had fallen from Bilbo. All through their talk he was only half listening to them. He sat nearest to the door with one ear cocked for any beginnings of a sound without. His other was alert for echoes beyond the murmurs of the dwarves, for any whisper of a movement from far below. Darkness grew deeper, and he grew ever more uneasy. Shut the door, he begged them. I fear that the dragon in my marrow. I like this silence far less than the uproar of last night. Shut the door before it is too late. Something in his voice gave the dwarves an uncomfortable feeling. Slowly Thorin shook off his dreams, and getting up, he kicked away the stone that wedged the door. Then they thrust upon it, and it closed with a snap and a clang. No trace of a keyhole was there left on the inside. 
They were shut in the mountain. And not a moment too soon. They had hardly gone any distance down the tunnel when a blow smote the side of the mountain like the crash of battering rams made of forest oaks and swung by giants. The rock boomed, the walls cracked, and the stones fell from the roof on their heads. What would have happened if the door had still been opened? I don't like to think. They fled further down the tunnel, glad to be still alive, while behind them, outside, they heard the roar and rumble of Smog's fury. He was breaking rocks to pieces, smashing wall and cliff with the lashings of his huge tail, till their little lofty camping ground, the scorched grass, the thrush's stone, the snail-covered walls, the narrow ledge, and all disappeared in a jumble of smithereens, and an avalanche of splintered stones fell over the cliff into the valley below. Smog had left his lair in silent stealth, quietly soared into the air, and then floated heavy and slow in the dark like a monstrous crow, down the wind towards the west of the mountain, in the hopes of catching unawares something or somebody there, and of spying the outlet to the passage which the thief had used. This was the outburst of his wrath when he could find nobody and see nothing, even where he guessed the outlet must actually be. After he had let off his rage in this way, he felt better, and he thought in his heart that he would not be troubled again from that direction. In the meanwhile, he had further vengeance to take. Peril rider, he snorted. Your feet came from the waterside, and up the water you came without a doubt. I don't know your smell, but if you are not one of those men of the lake, you had their help. They shall see me and remember who is the real king under the mountain. He rose in fire and went away south towards the running river. Chapter 13 Not at Home In the meanwhile the dwarves sat in darkness, and utter silence fell about them. Little they ate, and little they spoke. They could not count the passing of time, and they scarcely dared to move, for the whisper of their voices echoed and rustled in the tunnel. If they dozed, they woke still to darkness and to silence, going on unbroken. At last, after days and days of waiting, as it seemed, when they were becoming choked and dazed for want of air, they could bear it no longer. They would almost have welcomed sounds from below of the dragon's return. In the silence they feared some cunning devilry of his, but they could not sit there forever. Thorin spoke. Let us try the door, he said. I must feel the wind on my face soon or die. I think I would rather be smashed by smog in the open than suffocate in here. So several of the dwarves got up and groped back to where the door had been but they found that the upper end of the tunnel had been shattered and blocked with broken rock. Neither key nor the magic it had once obeyed would ever open that door again. "'We are trapped!' they groaned. "'This is the end! We shall die here!' But somehow, just when the dwarves were most despairing, Bilbo felt a strange lightening of the heart, as if a heavy weight had gone from under his waistcoat. "'Come, come!' he said, while there's life, there's hope, as my father used to say, and third time pays for all. I'm going down the tunnel once again. I've been that way twice, when I knew there was a dragon at the other end. So I will risk a third visit when I am no longer sure. Anyway, the only way out is down, and I think this time you had better all come with me. In desperation they agreed, and Thorn was the first to go forward, by Bilbo's side. "'Now be careful,' whispered the hobbit, "'and as quiet as you can be. There may be no smog at the bottom, but then again there may be. Don't let us take any unnecessary risks.' Down, down they went. The dwarves could not, of course, compare with the hobbit in real stealth, and they made a deal of puffing and shuffling, which echoes magnified alarmingly. But though every now and again Bilbo and Fear stopped and listened, not a sound stirred below. Near the bottom, as well as he could judge, Bilbo slipped on his ring and went ahead. But he did not need it. The darkness was complete, 
and they were all invisible, ring or no ring. In fact, so black was it that the hobbit came to the opening unexpectedly, put his hand on air, stumbled forward, and rolled headlong into the hall. There he lay face downwards on the floor, and did not dare to get up, or hardly even to breathe, but nothing moved. There was not a gleam of light, unless, as it seemed to him, when at last he slowly raised his head, there was a pale white glint above him and far off in the gloom. But certainly it was not a spark of dragon fire, though the worm stench was heavy in the place, and the taste of vapor was on his tongue. At length Mr. Baggins could bear it no longer. "'Confound you, smog, you worm!' he squeaked aloud. "'Stop playing hide-and-seek! Give me a light, and then eat me if you can catch me!' Faint echoes ran round the unseen hall, but there was no answer. Bilbo got up and found that he did not know in what direction to turn. "'Now I wonder what on earth Smog is playing at,' he said. "'He's not at home today, or tonight, or whatever it is, I do believe. "'If Owen and Glowen had not lost their tinder boxes, "'perhaps we can make a little light and have a look around before the luck turns.' "'Light!' he cried. "'Can anybody make a light?' The dwarves, of course, were very alarmed when Bilbo fell forward down the step with a bump into the hall, and they sat huddled just where he had left them at the end of the tunnel. Shh, shh, they hissed when they heard his voice, and though that helped the hobbit to find out where they were, it was some time before he could get anything else out of them. But in the end, when Bilbo actually began to stamp on the floor and screamed out, Light! At the top of his shrill voice, Thorin gave way, and Owen and Glowen were sent back to their bundles at the top of the tunnel. After a while, a twinkling gleam showed them returning. Owen with a small pine torch, a light in his hand, and Glowen with a bundle of others under his arm. Quickly, Bilbo trotted to the door and took the torch, but he could not persuade the dwarves to light the others or to come and join him yet. As Thorin carefully explained, Mr. Baggins was still officially their expert burglar and investigator. If he liked to risk a light, that was his affair. They would wait in the tunnel for his report. So they sat near the door and watched. They saw the little dark shape of the hobbit start across the floor, holding his tiny light aloft. Every now and again, while he was still near enough, they caught a glint and a tinkle, and he stumbled on some golden thing. The light grew smaller as he wandered away into the vast hall. Then it began to rise, dancing into the air. Bilbo was climbing the great mound of treasure. Soon he stood upon the top and still went on. Then they saw him halt and stoop for a moment, but they did not know the reason. It was the Arkenstone, the heart of the mountain, so Bilbo guessed from Thorin's description, but indeed there could not be two such gems, even in so marvelous a hoard, even in all the world. Ever as he climbed, the same white gleam had shone before him, and drawn his feet towards it. Slowly it grew to a little globe of pallid light. Now as he came near, it was tinged with a flickering sparkle of many colors at the surface reflected and splintered from the wavering light of his torch. At last he looked down upon it, and he caught his breath. The great jewel shone before his feet of its own inner light, and yet cut and fashioned by the dwarves who had dug it from the heart of the mountain long ago, it took all light that fell upon it and changed it into ten thousand sparks of white radiance shot with glints of the rainbow. Suddenly, Bilbo's arm went towards it, drawn by its enchantment. His small hand would not close about it, for it was a large and heavy gem, but he lifted it, shut his eyes, and put it in his deepest pocket. Now I am a burglar indeed, thought he, but I suppose I must tell the dwarves about it some time. They did say I could pick and choose my own share, and I think I would choose this, if they took all the rest. 
All the same, he had an uncomfortable feeling that the picking and choosing had not really been meant to include this marvelous gem, and that trouble would yet come of it. Now he went on again. Down the other side of the great mound he climbed, and the spark of his torch vanished from the sight of the watching dwarves. But soon they saw it far away in the distance again. Bilbo was crossing the floor of the hall. He went on until he came to the great doors at the further side, and there a drought of air refreshed him, but it almost puffed out his light. He peeped timidly through and caught a glimpse of great passages and of the dim beginnings of wide stairs going up into the gloom, and still there was no sight nor sound of smog. He was just going to turn and go back when a black shape swooped at him and brushed his face. He squeaked and started, stumbled backwards and fell. His torch dropped head downwards and went out. Only a bat, I suppose, and hope, he said miserably. But now what am I to do? Which is east, south, north, or west? Thorin! Balin! Owen! Glowen! Feely! Keely! He cried as loud as he could. It seemed a thin little noise in the wide blackness. The light's gone out! Someone come and find me and help me! For the moment, his courage had failed altogether. Faintly, the dwarves heard his small cries, though the only word they could catch was help. Now what on earth or under it has happened? said Thorin. Certainly not the dragon, or he would not go on squeaking. They waited a moment or two, and still there were no dragon noises. No sound at all, in fact, but Bilbo's distant voice. Come on, one of you, get another light or two, Thorn ordered. It seems we have to go and help our burglar. It is about our turn to help, said Balin, and I am quite willing to go. Anyway, I expect it's safe for the moment. Glowen lit several more torches, and then they all crept out, one by one, and went along the wall as hurriedly as they could. It was not long before they met Bilbo himself coming back towards them. His wits had quickly returned as soon as he saw the twinkle of their lights. Only a bat and a dropped torch, nothing worse, he said, in answer to their questions. Though they were much relieved, they were inclined to be grumpy at being frightened for nothing. But what they would have said if he had told them at that moment about the Arkenstone, I don't know. The mere fleeting glimpses of treasure which they had caught as they went along had rekindled all the fire of their dwarvish hearts. And when the heart of a dwarf, even the most respectable, is wakened by gold and by jewels, he grows suddenly bold, and he may become fierce. The dwarves, indeed, no longer needed any urging. All were now eager to explore the hall while they had the chance, and willing to believe that, for the present, smog was away from home. Each now gripped the lighted torch, and as they gazed, first on one side and then on another, they forgot fear and even caution. They spoke aloud and cried out to one another, as they lifted old treasures from the mound or from the wall and held them in the light, caressing and fingering them. Feely and Keeley were almost in merry mood, and finding still hanging there many golden harps strung with silver, they took them and struck them, and being magical, and also untouched by the dragon, who had small interest in music, they were still in tune. The dark hall was filled with a melody that had long been silent, but most of the dwarves were more practical. They gathered gems and stuffed their pockets, and let what they could not carry fall back through their fingers with a sigh. Thorin was not least among these, but always he searched from side to side for something which he could not find. It was the Arkenstone, but he spoke of it yet to no one. Now the dwarves took down mail and weapons from the walls, and armed themselves. Royal indeed did Thorin look, clad in a coat of gold-plated rings with a silver-hafted axe in a belt crusted with scarlet stones. "'Mr. Baggins!' he cried. "'Here is the first payment of your reward. Cast off your old coat and put on this!' With that he put on Bilbo a small coat of mail, wrought for some young elf prince long ago. It was of silver steel, which the elves called mithril, 
and with it went a belt of pearls and crystals, a light helm of figured leather, strengthened beneath with hoops of steel, and studded about the brim with white gems, was set upon the hobbit's head. I feel magnificent, he thought, but I expect I look rather absurd. How they would laugh on the hill at home! Still I wish there was a looking-glass handy. All the same, Mr. Baggins kept his head more clear of the bewitchment of the horde than the dwarves did. Long before the dwarves were tired of examining the treasures, he became weary of it, and sat down on the floor, and he began to wonder nervously what the end of it all would be. I would give a good many of these precious goblets, he thought, for a drink of something cheering out of one of Baron's wooden bowls. Thorin, he cried aloud, what next? We are armed, but what good has any armor ever been before against Smog the Dreadful? This treasure is not yet won back. We are not looking for gold yet, but for a way to escape, and we have tempted luck too long. You speak the truth, answered Thorin, recovering his wits. Let us go. I will guide you. Not in a thousand years should I forget the way of this palace. Then he hailed the others, and they gathered together, and holding their torches above their heads, they passed through the gaping doors, not without many a backward glance of longing. Their glittering mail they had covered again with their old cloaks, and their bright helms with their tattered hoods, and one by one they walked behind Thorin a line of little lights in the darkness that halted often, listening in fear once more for any rumor of the dragon's coming. Though all the old adornments were long moldered or destroyed, and though all was befouled and blasted with the comings and goings of the monster, Thorin knew every passage and every turn. They climbed long stairs, and turned and went down wide, echoing ways, and turned again and climbed yet more stairs, and yet more stairs again. These were smooth, cut out of the living rock, broad and fair, and up, up the dwarves went, and they met no sign of any living thing, only furtive shadows that fled from the approach of their torches, fluttering in the droughts. The steps were not made all the same for hobbit legs, and Bilbo was just feeling that he could go on no longer when suddenly the roof sprang high, and far beyond the reach of their torchlight a white glimmer could be seen coming through some opening far above, and the air smelt sweeter. Before them light came dimly through great doors that hung twisted on their hinges and half burnt. This is the great chamber of Thror, said Thorin, the hall of feasting and of council. Not far off now is the front gate. They passed through the ruined chamber. Tables were rotting there. Chairs and benches were lying there overturned, charred and decaying. Skulls and bones were upon the floor among flagons and bowls and broken drinking horns and dust. As they came through yet more doors at the further end, a sound of water fell upon their ears, and the gray light grew suddenly more full. "'There is the birth of the running river,' said Thorin. "'From here it hastens to the gate. Let us follow it.' Out of a dark opening in a wall of rock there issued a boiling water, and it flowed swirling in a narrow channel, carved and made straight and deep by the cunning of ancient hands. Beside it ran a stone-paved road, wide enough for many men abreast. Swiftly along this they ran, and round a wide sweeping turn, and behold, before them stood the broad light of day. In front there rose a tall arch, still showing the fragments of old cavern work within, worn and splintered and blackened though it was. A misty sun sent its pale light between the arms of the mountain, and beams of gold fell on the pavement at the threshold. A whirl of bats, frightened from slumber by their smoking torches, flurried over them as they sprang forward, their feet slithered on stones, rubbed smooth and slimed by the passing of the dragon. Now before them the water fell noisily outward, and foamed down towards the valley. 
they flung their pale torches to the ground and stood gazing out with dazzled eyes. They were come to the front gate and were looking out upon Dale. Well, said Bilbo, I never expected to be looking out of this door, and I never expected to be so pleased to see the sun again and to feel the wind on my face. But, ow, this wind is cold. It was. A bitter easterly breeze blew with a threat of oncoming winter. It swirled over and round the arms of the mountain into the valley and sighed among the rocks. After their long time, in the stewing depths of the dragon-haunted caverns, they shivered in the sun. Suddenly Bilbo realized that he was not only tired, but also very hungry indeed. It seems to be late morning, he said, and so I suppose it is more or less breakfast time, if there is any breakfast to have, but I don't feel that Smog's front doorstep is the safest place for a meal. Do let's go somewhere we can sit quiet for a bit. Quite right, said Balin, and I think I know which way we should go. We ought to make for the old lookout post at the southwest corner of the mountain. How far is that? asked the hobbit. Five hours' march, I should think. It'll be rough going. The road from the gate along the left edge of the stream seems all broken up, but look down there. The river loops suddenly east across Dale and in front of the ruined town. At that point there was once a bridge leading to steep stairs that climbed up the right bank, and so to a road running toward Ravenville. There is or was a path that left the road and climbed up to the post. A hard climb, too, even if the old steps are still there. Dear me, grumbled the hobbit, more walking and more climbing, without breakfast? I wonder how many breakfasts and other meals we have missed inside that nasty, clockless, timeless hole. As a matter of fact, two nights and the day between had gone by, and not altogether without food, since the dragon smashed the magic door. But Bilbo had quite lost count, and it might have been one night or a week of nights, for all he could tell. "'Come, come,' said Thorin, laughing. His spirits had begun to rise again, and he rattled the precious stones in his pockets. "'Don't call my palace a nasty hole. You wait till it has been cleaned and redecorated.' "'That won't be till Smog's dead,' said Bilbo glumly. "'In the meanwhile, where is he? I would give a good breakfast to know.' I hope he is not up on the mountain looking down at us. That idea disturbed the dwarves mightily, and they quickly decided that Bilbo and Balin were right. We must move away from here, said Dory. I feel as if his eyes were on the back of my head. It's a cold, lonesome place, said Bomber. There may be drink, but I see no sign of food. A dragon would always be hungry in such parts. Come on, come on, cried the others. Let us follow Balin's path. Under the rocky wall to the right there was no path, so on they trudged among the stones on the left side of the river, and the emptiness and desolation soon sobered even Thorin again. The bridge that Balin had spoken of they found long fallen, and most of its stones were now only boulders in the shallow, noisy stream. But they forded the water without much difficulty and found the ancient steps, and climbed the high bank. After going a short way, they struck the old road, and before long came to a deep dell, sheltered among the rocks. There they rested for a while, and had such a breakfast as they could, chiefly cram and water. If you want to know what cram is, I can only say that I don't know the recipe, but it is biscuitish. Keeps good indefinitely. It is supposed to be sustaining, and is certainly not entertaining, being in fact very uninteresting except as a chewable exercise. It was made by the lakemen for long journeys. After that they went on again, and now the road struck westwards, and left the river, and the great shoulder of the south-pointing mountain spur drew ever nearer. At length they reached the hill path. It scrambled steeply up, and they plodded slowly one behind the other till at last, in the late afternoon, they came to the top of the ridge and saw the wintry sun going downwards to the west. Here they found a flat place without a wall on three sides, but back to the north by a rocky face in which there was an opening like a door. 
From that door there was a wide view, east and south and west. Here, said Balin, in the old days we used to always keep watchmen, and that door behind leads into a rock-hewn chamber that was made here as a guard room. There were several places like it round the mountain, but there seemed small need for watching in the days of our prosperity, and the guards were made over-comfortable, perhaps. Otherwise we might have had longer warning of the coming of the dragon, and things might have been different. Still, here we can now lie hid and sheltered for a while, and we can see much without being seen. Not much use if we have been seen coming here said Dory, who was always looking up towards the mountain's peak, as if he expected to see Smog perched there like a bird on a steeple. "'We must take our chance of that,' said Thorin. "'We can go no further today.' "'Hear, hear!' cried Bilbo, and flung himself on the ground. In the rock chamber there would have been room for a hundred, and there was a small chamber further in, more removed from the cold outside. It was quite deserted. Not even wild animals seemed to have used it in all the days of Smog's dominion. There they laid their burdens, and some threw themselves down at once and slept, but the others sat near the outer door and discussed their plans. In all their talk they came perpetually back to one thing. Where was Smog? They looked west, and there was nothing, and east there was nothing, and in the south there was no sign of the dragon but there was a gathering of very many birds. At that they gazed and wondered, but they were no nearer understanding it when the first cold stars came out. Chapter 14 Fire and Water Now if you wish, like the dwarves, to hear news of smog, you must go back again to the evening when he smashed the door and flew off in rage two days before. The men at the lake town, Esgroroth, were mostly indoors, for the breeze was from the black east and chill, but a few were walking on the quays and watching, as they were fond of doing. The stars shine out from the smooth patches of the lake as they opened in the sky. From their town the lonely mountain was mostly screened by the low hills at the far end of the lake, through a gap in which the running river came down from the north. Only its high peak could they see in clear weather, and they looked seldom at it, for it was ominous and drear, even in the light of morning. Now it was lost and gone, blotted in the dark. Suddenly it flickered back to view. A brief glow touched it and faded. Look, said one, the lights again. Last night the watchmen saw them start and fade from midnight until dawn. Something is happening up there. Perhaps the king under the mountain is forging gold, said another. It is long since he went north. It is time the songs began to prove themselves again. Which king? said another with a grim voice. As like as not it is the marauding fire of the dragon, the only king under the mountain we have ever known. You are always foreboding gloomy things, said the others. Anything from floods to poisoned fish. Think of something cheerful. Then suddenly a great light appeared in the low place, in the hills and the northern end of the lake turned golden. The king beneath the mountain, they shouted. His wealth is like the sun, his silver like a fountain, his river's golden run. The river is running gold from the mountain, they cried, and everywhere windows were opening and feet were hurrying. There was once more a tremendous excitement and enthusiasm, but the grim-voiced fellow ran hot-foot to the master. "'The dragon is coming, or I am a fool!' he cried. "'Cut the bridges! To arms! To arms!' Then warning trumpets were suddenly sounded and echoed along the rocky shores. The cheering stopped and the joy was turned to dread. So it was that the dragon did not find them quite unprepared." Before long, so great was his speed, they could see him as a spark of fire rushing towards them, and growing ever huger and more bright, and not the most foolish doubted that the prophecies had gone rather wrong. Still, they had a little time. Every vessel in the town was filled with water, every warrior was armed, every arrow and dart was ready, 
and the bridge to the land was thrown down and destroyed before the roar of smog's terrible approach grew loud and the lake rippled red as fire beneath the awful beating of his wings amid shrieks and wailing and the shouts of men he came over them swept towards the bridges and was foiled the bridge was gone and his enemies were on an island in deep water too deep and dark and cool for his liking if he plunged into it a vapor and a steam would arise enough to cover all the land with a mist for days but the lake was mightier than he it would quench him before he could pass through roaring he swept back over the town a hail of dark arrows leaped up and snapped and rattled on his scales and jewels and their shafts fell back kindled by his breath burning and hissing into the lake no fireworks you ever imagined equaled the sights that night at the twanging of the bows and the shrilling of the trumpets the dragon's watch blazed to its height till he was blind and mad with it no one had dared to give battle to him for many an age nor would they have dared now if it had not been for the grim-voiced man bard was his name who ran to and fro cheering on the archers and urging the master to order them to fire to the last arrow fire leaped from the dragon's jaws he circled for a while high in the air above them lighting all the lake the trees by the shore shone like copper and like blood with leaping shadows of dense black at their feet then down he swooped straight through the arrow storm reckless in his rage taking no heed to turn his scaly sides towards his foes seeking only to set their town ablaze fire leaped from the thatched roofs and wooden beams ends as he hurtled down and passed and round again though all had been drenched with water before he came once more water was flung by a hundred hands wherever a spark appeared back swirled the dragon a sweep of his tail in the roof of the great house crumbled and smashed down flames unquenchable sprang high into the night another swoop and another and another house and then another sprang a fire and fell and still no arrow hindered smog or hurt him more than a fly from the marshes already men were jumping into the water on every side women and children were being huddled into laden boats in the market pool weapons were flung down there was mourning and weeping where but a little time ago the old songs of mirth to come had been sung about the dwarves now men cursed their names the master himself was turning to his great gilded boat hoping to row away in the confusion and save himself soon all the town would be deserted and burned down to the surface of the lake that was the dragon's hope they could all get into boats for all he cared there he could have fine sport hunting them, or they could stop till they starved. Let them try to get to land, and he would be ready. Soon he would set all the shore land, woods ablaze, and wither every field and pasture. Just now he was enjoying the sport of town baiting more than he had enjoyed anything for years. But there was still a company of archers that held their ground among the burning houses. Their captain was barred grim-voiced and grim-faced, whose friends had accused him of prophesying floods and poison fish, though they knew his worth and courage. He was a descendant in long line of Girion, lord of Dale, whose wife and child had escaped down the running river from the ruin long ago. Now he shot with a great yew bow, till all his arrows but one were spent. The flames were near him. His companions were leaving him, he bent his bow for the last time suddenly out of the dark something fluttered to his shoulder he started but it was only an old thrush unafraid it perched by his ear and it brought him news marveling he found he could understand its tongue for he was of the race of dale wait 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 it said to him the moon is rising look for the hollow of the left breast as he flies and turns above you and while Bard paused in wonder, it told him of tidings up in the mountain, and of all that it had heard. Then Bard drew his bowstring to his ear. The dragon was circling back, flying low, and as he came, 
the moon rose above the eastern shore and silvered his great wings. Arrow, said the bowman, black arrow, I have saved you out to the last. You have never failed me, and always I have recovered you. I had you from my father, and he from old. If ever you came from the forges of the true king under the mountain, go now and speed well. The dragon swooped once more, lower than ever, and as he turned and dived down, his belly glittered white with sparkling fires of gems in the moon, but not in one place. The great bow twanged. The black arrow sped straight from the string, straight for the hollow by the left breast where the foreleg was flung wide. In it smoked and vanished barb, shaft, and feather. So fierce was its flight. With a shriek that deafened men, felled trees and split stone, smog shot spouting into the air, turned over and crashed down from on high in ruin. Full on the town he fell. His last throes splintered it to sparks and gleeds. The lake roared in. A vast steam leaped up, white in the sudden dark under the moon. There was a hiss, a gushing whirl, and then silence. And that was the end of Smog and Eskaroth, but not of Bard. The waxing moon rose higher and higher, and the wind grew loud and cold. It twisted the white fog into bending pillars and hurrying clouds, and drove it off to the west to scatter in tattered shreds over the marshes before Mirkwood. Then the many boats could be seen dotted dark on the surface of the lake, and down the wind came the voices of the people of Eskaroth, lamenting their lost town and goods and ruined houses. But they had really much to be thankful for. Had they thought of it, though it could hardly be expected that they should just then. Three quarters of the people of the town had at least escaped alive. Their woods and fields and pastures and cattle and most of their boats remained undamaged, and the dragon was dead. What that meant they had not yet realized. They gathered in mournful crowds upon the western shores, shivering in the cold wind, and their first complaints and anger were against the master, who had left the town so soon, while some were still willing to defend it. "'He may have a good head for business, especially his own business,' some murmured, "'but he is no good when anything serious happens.' And they praised the courage of Bard and his last mighty shot. "'If only he had not been killed,' they all said, "'we would make him a king, Bard the dragon-shooter of the line of Girion. Alas, that he is lost!' And in the very midst of their talk, a tall figure stepped from the shadows. He was drenched with water. His black hair hung wet over his face and shoulders, and a fierce light was in his eyes. Bard is not lost, he cried. He dived from Eskaroth when the enemy was slain. I am Bard of the line of Gurion. I am the slayer of the dragon. King Bard! King Bard! they shouted but the master ground his chattering teeth. Gurion was lord of Dale, not king of Eskaroth, he said. In the lake town we have always elected masters from among the old and wise, and have not endured the rule of mere fighting men. Let King Bard go back to his own kingdom. Dale is now freed by his valor, and nothing hinders his return. And any that wish can go with him, if they prefer the cold stones under the shadow of the mountain to the green shores of the lake. The wise will stay here and hope to rebuild our town and enjoy again in time its peace and riches. We will have King Bard, the people near at hand shouted in reply. We have had enough of the old men and the money counters, and people further off took up the cry, up the bowmen and down with money bags, till the clamor echoed along the shore. I am the last man to undervalue Bard the bowman, said the master wearily, for Bard now stood close behind him. He has tonight earned an eminent place in the role of the benefactors of our town, and he is worthy of many imperishable songs. But why, O oh people? And here the master rose to his feet and spoke very loud and clear. Why do I get all your blame? For what fault am I to be deposed? Who aroused the dragon from his slumber, I might ask? Who obtained of us rich gifts and ample help, and led us to believe that old songs could come true? 
who played on our soft hearts and our pleasant fancies? What sort of gold have they sent down the river to reward us? Dragon fire and ruin! From whom should we claim the recompense of our damage and aid for our widows and orphans? As you see, the master had not got his position for nothing. The result of his words was that, for the moment, the people quite forgot their idea of a new king, and turned their angry thoughts towards Thorn and his company. Wild and bitter words were shouted from many sides, and some of those who had before sung the old songs loudest were now heard as loudly crying that the dwarves had stirred the dragon up against them deliberately. "'Fools!' said Bard. "'Why waste words and wrath on those unhappy creatures?' Doubtless they perished first in fire, before smog came to us. Then, even as he was speaking, the thought came into his heart of the fabled treasure of the mountain, lying without guard or owner, and he fell suddenly silent. He thought of the master's words, and of Dale rebuilt, and filled with golden bells, if he could find the men. At length he spoke again. This is no time for angry words, master, or for considering weighty plans of change. There is work to do. I serve you still, though after a while I may think again of your words and go north with any that will follow me. Then he strode off to help in the ordering of the camps and in the care of the sick and the wounded. But the master scowled at his back as he went and remained sitting on the ground. He thought much but said little, unless it was to call loudly for men to bring him fire and food. Now everywhere Bard went, he found talk running like fire among the people concerning the vast treasure that was now unguarded. Men spoke of the recompense for all their harm that they would soon get from it, and wealth over and to spare with which to buy rich things from the south, and it cheered them greatly in their plight. That was as well, for the night was bitter and miserable. Shelters could be contrived for few. The master had one, and there was little food. Even the master went short. Many took ill of wet and cold and sorrow that night, and afterwards died. Who had escaped uninjured from the ruin of the town, and in the days that followed there was much sickness and great hunger. Meanwhile Bard took the lead and ordered things as he wished, though always in the master's name, and he had a hard task to govern the people and direct the preparations for their protection and housing. Probably most of them would have perished in the winter that now hurried after autumn if help had not been to hand. But help came swiftly, for Bard at once had speedy messengers sent up the river to the forest to ask the aid of the king of the elves of the wood, and these messengers had found a host already on the move, although it was then only the third day after the fall of smog. The elven king had received news from his own messengers and from the birds that loved his folk, and already knew much of what had happened. Very great indeed was the commotion among all things with wings that dwelt on the borders of the desolation of the dragon. The air was filled with circling flocks, and their swift-flying messengers flew here and there across the sky. Above the borders of the forest there was whistling, crying, and piping. Far over Mirkwood, tidings spread. Smog is dead! Leaves rustled and startled. Ears were lifted. Even before the Elven King rode forth the news had passed west, right to the pine woods of the Misty Mountains. Bjorn had heard it in his wooden house, and the goblins were at council in their caves. That will be the last we shall hear of Thor and Oakenshield, I fear, said the King. He would have done better to have remained my guest. It is an ill wind all the same, he added, that blows no one any good, for he too had not forgotten the legend of the wealth of Thror. So it was that Bard's messengers found him now marching with many spearsmen and bowmen, and crows were gathered thick above him, for they thought war was awakening again, such as had not been in those parts for a long age. But the king, when he received the prayers of Bard, had pity, for he was the lord of a good and kindly people. So turning his march, which had at first been direct towards the mountain, he hastened now down the river to the long lake. 
he had not boats or rafts enough for his host, and they were forced to go the slower way by foot, but great store of goods he sent ahead by water. Still elves are light-footed, and though they were not in these days much used to the marches and the treacherous lands between the forest and the lake, their going was swift. Only five days after the death of the dragon they came upon the shores and looked on the ruins of the town. Their welcome was good, as may be expected, and the men and their master were ready to make any bargain for the future in return for the elven king's aid. Their plans were soon made. With the women and the children, the old and the unfit, the master remained behind, and with him were some men of crafts and many skilled elves, and they busied themselves, felling trees and collecting the timber sent down from the forest. Then they set about raising many huts by the shore against the oncoming winter, and also, under the master's direction, they began the planning of a new town, designed more fair and large even than before, but not in the same place. They removed northward, higher up the shore, for ever after they had a dread of the water where the dragon lay. He would never again return to his golden bed, but was stretched cold as stone, twisted upon the floor of the shallows. There for ages his huge bones could be seen in calm weather amid the ruined piles of the old town, but few dared to cross the cursed spot, and none dared to dive into the shivering water or recover the precious stones that fell from his rotting carcass. But all the men of arms, who were still able, and the most of the elven king's array, got ready to march north to the mountain. It was thus that in eleven days from the ruin of the town the head of their host passed the rock gates at the end of the lake and came into the desolate lands. Chapter 15 The Gathering of the Clouds Now we will return to Bilbo and the dwarves. All night one of them had watched, but when morning came they had not heard or seen any sign of danger, but ever more thickly the birds were gathering. Their companies came flying from the south, and the crows that still lived about the mountains were wheeling and crying unceasingly above. "'Something strange is happening,' said Thorin. "'The time is gone for the autumn wanderings, and these birds that dwell always in the land, there are starlings and flocks of finches, and far off there are many carrion birds as if a battle were afoot.' Suddenly Bilbo pointed. There is that old thrush again, he cried. He seems to have escaped when smog smashed the mountainside, but I don't suppose the snails have. Sure enough, the old thrush was there, and as Bilbo pointed, he flew towards them and perched on a stone nearby. Then he fluttered his wings and sang. Then he cocked his head on one side, as if to listen. And again he sang, and again he listened. I believe he is trying to tell us something, said Balin, but I cannot follow the speech of such birds. It is very quick and difficult. Can you make it out, Baggins? Not very well, said Bilbo. As a matter of fact, he could make nothing of it at all. But the old fellow seems very excited. I only wish he was a raven, said Balin. I thought you did not like them. You seem very shy of them when we came this way before. Those were crows, and nasty, suspicious-looking creatures at that, and rude as well. You must have heard the ugly names they were calling after us. But the ravens are different. There used to be great friendship between them and the people of Thoror, and they often brought us secret news, and were rewarded with such bright things as they coveted to hide in their dwellings. They live many a year, and their memories are long, and they hand on their wisdom to their children. I knew many among the ravens of the rock when I was a dwarf lad. This very height was once named Ravenhill, because there was a wise and famous pair, old Kark and his wife, that lived here above the guard chamber. But I don't suppose that any of that ancient breed linger here now. No sooner had he finished speaking than the old thrush gave a loud call and immediately flew away. We may not understand him, but that old bird understands us, I am sure, said Balin. Keep watch now and see what happens. Before long there was a fluttering of wings, and back came the thrush, and with 
came a most decrepit old bird. He was getting blind. He could hardly fly, and the top of his head was bald. He was an aged raven of great size. He alighted stiffly on the ground before them, slowly flapped his wings, and bobbed towards Thorin. O oh, Thorin, son of Thrain, and Balin, son of Fundin, he croaked, and Bilbo could understand what he said, for he used ordinary language and not bird speech. I am Roak, son of Cock. Cock is dead, but he was well known to you once. It is a hundred years and three and fifty since I came out of the egg. I do not forget what my father told me. Now I am the chief of the great ravens of the mountain. We are few, but we remember still the king that was of old. Most of my people are abroad, for there are great tidings in the south. Some are tidings of joy to you, and some you will not think so good. Behold, the birds are gathering back again to mountain and to dale from south and east and west, for word has got out that smog is dead. Dead? Dead? shouted the dwarfs. Dead? Then we have been in needless fear, and the treasure is ours. They all sprang up and began to caper about for joy. Yes, dead, said Roak. The thrush, may his feathers never fall, saw him die, and we may trust his words. He saw him fall in battle with the men of Eskaroth, the third night back from now at the rising of the moon. It was some time before Thorin could bring the dwarves to be silent and listen to the raven's news. At length, when he had told all the tale of the battle, he went on. So much joy, Thorin Oakenshield. You may go back to your halls in safety. All the treasure is yours for the moment. But many are gathering hither beside the birds. The news of the death of the guardian has already gone far and wide, and the legend of the wealth of Thror has not lost in the telling during many years. Many are eager for a share of the spoil. Already a host of the elves is on the way, and carrion birds with them, hoping for battle and slaughter by the lakemen murmur that their sorrows are due to the dwarves, for they are homeless and many have died, and smog has destroyed their town. They too think to find amends from your treasure, whether you are alive or dead. Your own wisdom must decide your course, but thirteen is small remnant of the great folk of Durin that once dwelt here and now are scattered far. If you will listen to my counsel, you will not trust the master of the lake men, but rather him that shot the dragon with his bow. Bard is he, of the race of Dale, of the line of Gurion. He is a grim man, but true. We would see peace once more among dwarves and men, and elves after the long desolation. But it may cost you dear in gold I have spoken. Then Thorin burst forth in anger. Our thanks, Roak Cox, son. You and your people shall not be forgotten. But none of our gold shall thieves take or the violent carry off while we are alive. If you would earn our thanks still more, bring us news of any that draw near. Also, I would beg of you, if any of you are still young and strong of wing, that you would send messengers to our kin in the mountains of the north, both west from here and east, and tell them of our plight. But go especially to my cousin Dane in the Iron Hills, for he has many people well armed, and dwells nearest to this place. Bid him hasten. I will not say if this counsel be good or bad, croaked Roak, but I will do what can be done. Then off he slowly flew. Back now to the mountain, cried Thorin. We have little time to lose. And little food to use, cried Bilbo, always practical on such points. 
In any case, he felt that the adventure was, properly speaking, over with the death of the dragon, in which he was much mistaken, and he would have given most of his share of the profits for the peaceful winding up of these affairs. "'Back to the mountain!' cried the dwarves, as if they had not heard him, so back he had to go with them. As you have heard some of the events already, you will see that the dwarves still had some days before them. They explored the caverns once more, and found, as they expected, that only the front gate remained open. All the other gates, except, of course, the small secret door, had long ago been broken and blocked by smog and no sign of them remained. So now they began to labor hard in fortifying the main entrance, and in making a new path that led from it. Tools were to be found in plenty that the miners and quarriers and builders of old had used, and at such work the dwarves were still very skilled. As they worked, the ravens brought them constant tidings. In this way they learned that the elven king had turned aside to the lake, and they still had a breathing space. Better still, they heard that three of their ponies had escaped and were wandering wild far down the banks of the running river, not far from where the rest of their stores had been left. So while the others went on with their work, Feely and Keely were sent, guided by a raven, to find the ponies and bring back all they could. They were four days gone, and by that time they knew that the joined armies of the lake men and the elves were hurrying toward the mountain. But now their hopes were higher, for they had food for some weeks with care, chiefly cram, of course, and they were very tired of it, but cram is much better than nothing, and already the gate was blocked with a wall of squared stones laid dry, but very thick and high across the opening. There were holes in the wall, through which they could see or shoot, but no entrance. They climbed in or out with ladders, and hauled stuff up with ropes. For the issuing of the stream they had contrived a small low arch under the new wall, but near the entrance they had so altered the narrow bed that a wide pool stretched from the mountain wall to the head of the fall over which the stream went towards Dale. Approach to the gate was now only possible without swimming along a narrow ledge of the cliff to the right as one looked outwards from the wall. The ponies they had brought only to the head of the steps above the old bridge and unloading them there had bidden them return to their masters and sent them back riderless to the south. There came a night when suddenly there were many lights as of fires and torches away down in Dale before them. They have come, said Balin, and their camp is very great. They must have come into the valley under the cover of dusk along both banks of the river. That night the dwarves slept little. The morning was still pale when they saw a company approaching. From behind their wall they watched them come up to the valley's head and climb slowly up. Before long they could see that both men of the lake, armed as if for war, and elvish bowmen were among them. At length the foremost of these climbed the tumbled rocks and appeared at the top of the falls, and very great was their surprise to see the pool before them, and the gate blocked with a wall of new hewn stone. As they stood pointing and speaking to one another, Thorin hailed them. "'Who are you?' he called in a very loud voice that come as if in war to the gates of Thorin, son of Thrain, king under the mountain, and what do you desire? But they answered nothing. Some turned swiftly back, and the others, after gazing for a while at the gate and its defenses, soon followed them. That day the camp was moved to the east of the river, right between the arms of the mountain. The rocks echoed then with voices and with song, as they had not done for many a day. There was the sound, too, of elven harps and of sweet music, and as it echoed up towards them, it seemed that the chill of the air was warmed, and they caught faintly the fragrance of woodland flowers blossoming in spring. Then Bilbo longed to escape from the dark fortress, and to go down and join in the mirth and feasting of by the fires. 
Some of the younger dwarves were moved in their hearts, too, and they muttered that they wished things had fallen out otherwise, and that they might welcome such folks as friends. But Thorin scowled. Then the dwarves themselves brought forth harps and instruments, regained from the hoard, and made music to soften his mood. But their song was not as elvish song, and was much like the song they had sung long before in Bilbo's little hobbit hole. Under the mountain, dark and tall, the king has come unto his hall. His foe is dead, the worm of dread, and ever so his foes shall fall. The sword is sharp, the spear is long, the arrow swift, the gate is strong, the heart is bold that looks on gold, the dwarves no more shall suffer wrong. The dwarves of yore made mighty spells, while hammers fell like ringing bells, in places deep where dark things sleep, in hollow halls beneath the fells. On silver necklaces they strung, the light of stars on crown they hung, the dragon-fire from twisted wire, the melody of harps they rung. The mountain throne once more is freed, O wandering folk, the summons heed. Come haste, come haste, across the waste, the king of friend and kin has need. Now call we over mountains cold, come back unto the caverns old. Here at the gates the king awaits, his hands are rich with gems and gold. The king is come unto his hall, under the mountain, dark and tall. The worm of dread is slain and dead, and ever so our foes shall fall. The song appeared to please Thorn, and he smiled again, and grew merry, and he began reckoning the distance to the iron hills, and how long it would be before Dane could reach the lonely mountain if he had set out as soon as the message reached him. But Bilbo's heart fell, both at the song and the talk. They sounded much too warlike. The next morning early a company of spearmen was seen crossing the river and marching up the valley. They bore with them the green banner of the elven king and the blue banner of the lake, and they advanced until they stood right before the wall at the gate. Again Thorin hailed them in a loud voice. Who are you that come armed for war to the gates of Thorin, son of Thrain, king under the mountain? This time he was answered. A tall man stood forward, dark of hair and grim of face, and he cried, Hail Thorin! Why do you fence yourself like a robber in his hold? We are not yet foes, and we rejoice that you are alive beyond our hope. We came expecting to find none living here. Yet now that we are met, there is a matter for a parley and a council. Who are you, and what would you parley? I am Bard, and by my hand was the dragon slain and your treasure delivered. Is that not a matter that concerns you? Moreover, I am by right descent the hare of Gurion, of Dale, and as your hoard is mingled much of the wealth of his halls and towns, which of old smog stole. Is not that a matter of which we may speak? Further, in his last battle, Smog destroyed the dwellings of the men of Eskaroth, and I am yet the servant of their master. I would speak for him, and ask whether you have no thought for the sorrow and misery of his people. They aided you in your distress, and in recompense, you have thus far brought ruin only, though doubtless undesigned. Now these were fair words, and true if proudly and grimly spoken, and Bilbo thought that Thorin would at once admit what justice was in them. He did not, of course, expect that any one would remember that it was he who discovered all by himself the dragon's weak spot, and that was just as well, for no one ever did. But also he did not reckon with the power that gold has upon which a dragon has long brooded, nor with dwarvish hearts. Long hours in the past days Thorin had spent in the treasury, and the lust of it was heavy on him. Though he had hunted chiefly for the Arkenstone, yet he had an eye for many another wonderful thing that was lying there, about which were wound old memories of the labors and the sorrow of his race. "'You put your worst cause last and in the chief place,' Thorin answered. 
To the treasure of my people no man has a claim, because Smog, who stole it from us, also robbed him of life or home. The treasure was not his, that his evil deeds should be amended with a share of it. The price of the goods and the assistance that we received of the lake men we will fairly pay in due time, but nothing will we give, not even a loaf's worth, under threat of force, while an armed host lies before our doors. We look on you as foes and thieves. It is in my mind to ask what share of their inheritance you would have paid to our kindred had you found the horde unguarded and us slain. A just question, replied Bard, but you are not dead, and we are not robbers. Moreover, the wealthy may have pity beyond right on the needy that befriended them when they were in want, and still my other claims remain unanswered. I will not parley, as I have said, with armed men at my gate, not at all with the people of the Elven King, whom I remember with small kindness. In this debate they have no place. Be gone now, ere our arrows fly, and if you would speak with me again, first dismiss the elvish host to the woods where it belongs, and then return, laying down your arms before you approach the threshold. The Elven King is my friend, and he has secured the people of the lake in their need, though they had no claim but friendship on him, answered Bard. We will give you time to repent your words, gather your wisdom, ere we return. Then he departed and went back to the camp. Ere many hours were passed, the banner-bearers returned, and trumpeters stood forth and blew a blast. In the name of Eskaroth and the forest, one cried, we speak unto Thorin Thrain, son of Oakenshield, calling himself the king under the mountain, and we bid him consider well the claims that have been urged, or be declared our foe. At the least, he shall deliver one-twelfth portion of the treasure unto Bard, as the dragon slayer, and as the heir of Gurion. From that portion, Bard will himself contribute to the aid of Eskaroth. But if Thorin would have the friendship and honor of the lands about, as his sires had of old, then he will give also somewhat of his own for the comfort of the men of the lake." Then Thorin seized a bow of horn and shot an arrow at the speaker. It smote into his shield and stuck there quivering. Since such is your answer, he called in return, I declare the mountain besieged. You shall not depart from it until you call on your side for a truce and a parley. We will bear no weapon against you, but we leave you to your gold. You may eat that if you will. With that the messengers departed swiftly, and the dwarves were left to consider their case. So grim had Thorn become that even if they had wished, the others would not have dared to find fault with him, but indeed most of them seemed to share his mind, except perhaps old fat Bomber and Feely and Keeley. Bilbo, of course, disapproved of the whole turn of affairs. He had by now had more than enough of the mountain and being besieged inside it was not at all to his taste. The whole place still stinks of dragon, he grumbled to himself, and it makes me sick, and cram is beginning simply to stick in my throat. 